Hello, welcome and good evening. And today we have a quite old and interesting guest, I think. It's the Commodore 1084S. This variant is actually the P1, I think, because it's a monitor that has seen many revisions. The Commodore 1084 before that. The S actually stands for stereo. It has two speakers built in. And yeah, I do have an Amiga lying around, which I will set up in a later episode. But I didn't have a screen matching this. So I got this one here. And it is working, but it has a few minor problems. Um, for now, the lid here is not keeping shut because, as with most of these, uh, the little pin broke off. But I'm getting a 3D printed replacement for that. You will see that in a later episode as well. The major problem is that the power switch at the back doesn't work. It just doesn't um, arrest anymore. You just push it, and you have to hold it or stick something to it to keep it running. Otherwise, this thing works fine. This model here has a lot of controls at the front, as you can see, a couple at the back, but um, yeah, we will turn it around in a short while to see what's behind there. So what's actually the deal with all the CFTs and stuff? I think it actually looks nice. Um, the picture quality is, of course, objectively worse than on an LCD, but it's also much nicer because it's warm and fuzzy pictures. And a lot of the times people say the lag is better when you're doing gaming. And I didn't believe them at first um, because I thought, oh, our TV or LCD TV is great. But then I played on this one here, um, actually with the Atari, and I noticed it's actually true. I was playing Mappy and I was jumping off the ledges much earlier than I needed to because that's at least two, three frames of lag in an LCD TV. And um, so there's that definitely going on for this little machine. But of course, it comes with its own problems. First of all, these things are getting more expensive by the day. Um, sometimes you can get a cheap one like this one. But often these fetch far more than 100 euros, sometimes even more, depending on which CRT, which model, etc. So that's actually getting crazy. Plus you have to work on them, like fixing small stuff, the power button, um, the flyback transformers will fail eventually. That's a big operation. That's still fine with this one. The phosphor will degrade at some point. They just won't work anymore. But for now, they are still working and who knows? Maybe there will be some crazy factory who will redo such things in the future, but I doubt it because the market is probably way too small for that. Um, yeah, also with this one, um, the right speaker is currently not working, but I have to check that out. I think that's fixable. Um, that's probably just a cabling problem or something, but we will figure that out as well. Probably not in this episode though. Um, but let's first try to fix this and then test it out with some Atari game. Uh, but let's have a look at the backside, because you might have a different kind of 1084S that you want to repair. And yeah, there's a few things that you can see on the backside uh, that are different from uh, different models. So this is the backside, and as you can see, this model was manufactured in June 1992. That's 28 years ago, so this thing is almost hitting 30 years and still running strong. But 1992 is already near the end of the Commodore and Amiga era. Shortly thereafter, Commodore went bankrupt and yeah, there were still Commodore Amigas manufactured by ESCOM for a while, but by 1994 everything I think was folded. So this is definitely one of the latest and last revisions. Oh, actually, it's the D2, not the P1. But I think the P1 is quite similar. So the 1084S D2, probably for Germany, Deutschland, I'm not sure. Um, but I think it's similar to the P1. So here's the power button. Um, 
the usual socket for the power, some more adjustment wheels, and then there's the big difference compared to the earlier 1084s. There's a 9-pin RGB connector. The earlier ones do have SCART input, which is useful because uh, there's a lot of SCART cables for Amigas and other devices, but we don't have that. Then there's two um, buttons for switching between the RGB and these ports. These are Chinch ports, composite, left and right audio for stereo sound, plus I think it's sync composite or something. And this is actually what I'm using for the Atari. So I can switch this between the Amiga and the Atari, for example. For the Amiga, you need a special cable. And I've got a custom one here because they are hard to get by. On one hand, on one end, there's the 9-pin connector. And on the other one, a 23-pin DB connector. However, those are not made anymore. So Instead, people sell the DB25 pin and they just cut off a bit here. So it's a bit weird looking, but they sealed it off with some resin or something. So it's it's a proper job here. It will work, um, but if you can get hold of an original Commodore Amiga monitor cable, that's even nicer. Because, frankly, you don't get these connectors anymore. Yeah, so that's what's on the back of the monitor and the cable that you need for running it with an Amiga. And uh, the next step should be to open this thing up. However, please don't try this at home. Um, make sure if you do this um, that you know what you're doing, that the monitor is discharged. Uh, I've had it sitting here for a week without using. Um, I talked with the power switch a couple of times um, in the hopes that it will discharge. The tube itself can still hold quite a huge voltage, so make sure that you don't touch that, that you don't touch any parts inside there that you don't need to, and that you be extra careful. And if you're unhappy with any of that, then please don't try it at home. You can definitely seriously hurt yourself. That being said, I'm gonna try it now. Um, I'm gonna show you the replacement part that we need. So this is the power switch that sits behind this button. It's a so-called TV switch. I think it's a type 3, I'm not sure. But after googling for a while, I found a shop, online shop here in Germany, that sells these. And these are basically, um, I'm not sure what they call them, but they are push switches, which will uh, push in. And when you press them again, they will depress. And they have four pins that connect through when you push them for the live and neutral. And there's this metal shield which gives them more strength plus some plastic pins. And this is actually the exact thing that fits into the D2 model. And they were used in a lot of televisions of the, of the era, but it's getting harder to get replacements because of course CRT televisions are not produced anymore. And so the need for such things also has diminish greatly. But if you're lucky, um, you can still get them. I will try to link to the shopping question where I got mine, but um, you might need to use some different shop which ships to your country or wherever you live. Um, yeah, so let's open up this thing. There are a couple of screws that we need to undo and then we'll do the desoldering and the soldering. So once you unscrewed all the screws and removed the outer case, you can compare on the bottom of the uh, PCB of the monitor that this switch actually fits. Um, and here's uh, another view from the side. And also, yeah, it looks very dusty, but it looks like this will be a perfect match. So next step is to take our new toy uh, some tacky flux made by the company Emil Otto, but you can basically use any flux. It will greatly help with the desoldering job. And this one here comes in a nice one um, use syringe with a little pipe attached to it, which makes it easier to put it onto the PCB. So we put a little gob of flux on every solder joint that we want to remove. I think I even got a little bit too 
flux happy here, but uh, well, I think there's not never enough flux. So we just put that on there and uh, it's actually pretty hard to get it out if it's not heated up. Then we take our suction pump. You can also use a desoldering gun if you have one. I don't have one yet, but I think it could be useful. And then you heat up your iron to something like 350 degrees Celsius. And when the solder is molten, you can just suck it away. And this actually works pretty well on this board. I didn't have any problems. There were no pads that were lifting or anything. So make sure to work on the pads. Alternately, so that you don't heat up the PCB too much. I didn't do a lot of desoldering jobs, but this is definitely one of the easiest that I had to do. Just leave the iron a couple of seconds on each joint, clear out the pump and then suck away the remaining solder. You can repeat this as often as necessary, but usually there will be a little bit of um, solder left and you can just uh, wiggle the pin free very, very carefully while doing this and uh, you should be fine. Once you are content with uh, the joint, you can move on to the next one. Make sure to do this in a ventilated area or to use one of the fume filters that are also recommended. Uh, otherwise, keep clear of the fumes produced by the flux because they are definitely not healthy. The upper two pins are needing a little bit more heat because they attach to the metal shield that holds the whole thing into place. So after applying generous amounts of heat there, we can actually wiggle free the lower part already and uh, the remaining solder joints just need a little bit of heating, additional heating and then the whole switch is actually freed from the PCB. So here's the actual culprit. This switch has been in use for 25 years or so and finally gave up. It's still dirty and dusty. Let's just throw it away and uh, take the new one. This is the replacement and yeah, they look pretty similar. Apart from the color, the shape matches perfectly and this should be a very easy job to put back into the monitor and get it up and running again. So let's do just that. And don't forget to put on the plastic cap before putting it all in because you don't want to have this thing sticking out the back just like that. And other than that, just apply copious amounts of heat and solder, because this is actually a 240 or 250 volt thing that you are soldering in there, so you don't want any dry solder joints. After reassembling the case, we can actually uh, try to test the whole thing. So let's turn it carefully around. Always take care that the front of the CRTs is very heavy. You don't want to drop it. That's also why I put a cloth underneath, just that I don't get any scratches or breaks. So here goes nothing. Let's switch it on and at least no smoke. We have an LED light and slowly I think, yes, there is a picture and it works. It seems perfectly. The lines that you're seeing that are scanning across the screen is an artifact from the way that the CRT displays something in conjunction with the um, refresh rate of the camera that I'm using. So let's play a round of Mappy to test it out actually what it feels like to play on the CRT and I must say it feels very good. I actually jumped off the ledges way too early because I was used to quite a significant amount of lag on my LCD TV and this feels so much better I have to admit. Plus the pixels look absolutely stunning because the picture is much softer. You can't see the noise that the Atari output is actually generating. It's just filtered in a way in the analog goodness of the screen. So yeah, I think um, this monitor will see quite some usage until it breaks down and can't re be repaired at all. But I think it was a worthwhile investment and it will serve a good purpose here in my new home office basically. So I think we will need to fix a few other small things in the next episodes with this. But that's it for this part. All right. I think this was a 
great success. The power button works. Uh, we didn't break anything and it was relatively easy. And um, the old power switch we can simply throw away. It has served its purpose for over 20 years, well over 25 years actually. And yeah, our next step will be to replace the broken pin here and to fix the speaker on the right side. And I think I will cover that in an upcoming episode. Until then, please leave a comment. Did you have one of these? Do you want one of these? Um, do you rather use an LCD? Whatever um, comes to your mind. Share, like and subscribe as usual. And um, please come back for the next video. See you.